It's official. On August 6th, 2024, China launched its very first batch of 18 Qianfan satellites. Qianfan, aka G60 Starlink, or 1000 Sails, is one of China's two mega constellations, the other one being China Satnet's Xinguang constellation. Both these constellations have the same objective, deploying tens of thousands of broadband communication satellites into low Earth orbit to revolutionize connectivity around the world. Now, the Chinese aren't the first to do this. As of September 2024, SpaceX has deployed over 6,000 Starlink satellites, OneWeb has completed Generation 1 of its constellation last year, and there are new contenders like Telesat, Amazon, and others. Now, I have a separate video on the history of each of these two Chinese mega constellations, so I won't cover their background here. But for context, these are state-sponsored projects having emerged in the past four years. Both have access to very deep pocket funding and aim at commercial, civil, and possibly military applications around the world. But here's the billion dollar question as for all these mega projects, can China actually pull it off? And which factors could make or break their success? Let's find out. Let's set aside funding for now. While many mega constellations struggle due to the staggering costs linked to the scale of these projects, China's constellations are state or province sponsored endeavors. They are considered critical infrastructure. Therefore, unless there's some kind of economic meltdown for some reason, China's constellations should get the required funding. This sort of puts them in the same category as Starlink and Kuiper, which are funded by space driven billionaires. And in contrast with the Telesats and OneWebs and Iris Squares of the world, which have to fight to get the necessary funding. Now let's look at launch capacity, and this is where we hit challenge number one. Now, before we get into launch challenges, I'd like to share with you a tool that I've been using recently called MyHeritage and who are kindly sponsoring this video. I've recently partnered with them to do something that I've always wanted to do for a very long time, which is map out my family tree and try to track down lost and forgotten relatives. So I began this quest by building my family tree with what I knew using my heritage's online tool. And what's amazing is that as you start adding info, my heritage is able to deep dive into the 20 billion historical documents that they have in their database and use their intelligence to help you connect the dots. And so I started asking my parents and my grandparents about their own grandparents, as well as stories of any distant, remarkable relative that they had heard of. And their memories weren't always very detailed. I'd sometimes just get a name or a birth date or the location of the relatives passing away. But as I started inputting this in my Heritage's search engine and tweaking the filters, I was able to dig up an unimaginable number of historical documents. I found, for example, records of my great grandfather who passed away during World War II. And as I started digging into the 19th century, I found handwritten documents of relatives and even this document that you can see here, which dates back to the early 19th century. There was a certain Jean Deville who was born in 1811 and who received the Légion d'honneur in 1841. The Légion d'honneur being, for those who don't know, the French Order of Merit established by Napoleon. And so the story of this Jean de Ville who lived 200 years ago was vaguely known by my family, but nothing as close as to reading actual historical documents of his deeds back in the 19th century. So that was a very, very pleasant and warm experience. Anyway, if family history is your thing, I strongly encourage you to check out my heritage. You will absolutely love it. And I haven't even scratched the surface of the features they offer. There's, for example, an old photograph, colorizing and enhancing tool. My Heritage are currently offering a 14 day free trial. So feel free to sign up and enjoy the countless features that they have to offer. Thank you, My Heritage, for supporting the channel. And with that, back to China launching its mega constellations. This is the Qianfan constellation deployment calendar. The satellite operator, Shanghai Yuanshan, wants to deploy 108 satellites in 2024, 648 by 2025 to enable a regional service coverage, 1296 by 2027 to enable a global service coverage, 
and a whopping 15,000 satellites by the end of 2030 for an enhanced global coverage. We also know that these satellites will be deployed by batches of either 18, 36, and in the future, 54 satellites. And so with all of this in mind, we can estimate the number of launches required to deploy the full constellation. And this is where things get wild. Six launches would be required in total in 2024, which is a reasonable amount of launches, but this increases to 15 in 2025, and then nine launches per year in 2026 and 2027. But more importantly, 84 launches per year between 2028 and 2030, dedicated only to Qianfan satellites. Now, 84 launches per year, that's an insane number. That's more than all of the launches which took place in China last year, and that's one and a half times the number of Starlink launches, which took place in 2023. So is there such a launch capacity in China? Well, we know roughly the mass of each Qianfan satellite at 300 kilograms, which means that we also know the payload capacity of the rockets required for the launch. And the good news is there are quite a few Chinese rockets in development, both from state-owned and commercial companies, which would satisfy these launch requirements. Many of them are designed to be reusable, landing vertically a la SpaceX Falcon 9, therefore pushing down the costs of launching into space. But if we look at the entry to service dates of these rockets, there isn't much room for delays. Most of these rockets have their maiden launches in 2025 and 2026, and we can only imagine that the implementation subsequently of reusability, of scaling up the production, and of refurbishing will also take some time. Now, challenge number three is launch pad availability. China completed this year the Hainan International Commercial Launch Center, which includes two launch pads for liquid-filled rockets, able to accommodate up to 32 launches annually. This launch site will be optimized for Chinese commercial rockets, as well as the Long March 8. Now, if used at full capacity, this launch site is enough for the 2025 and 2027 Qianfan Constellation deployment targets, but it's far from the 80 plus annual launches required for the full deployment. And so to mitigate this, Chinese commercial companies are currently building their own launch pads in Zhoutren in the Inner Mongolian Desert. For now, we know that at least Landspace, Caspace, and Space Pioneer are each building their own launch facilities, and it's likely that their fellow domestic competitors like Galactic Energy and iSpace and the others will follow. China may also use their existing launch infrastructure like the Taiyuan launch site, which is, by the way, the one that recently launched the first batch of Qianfan satellites on a Long March 6A. But remember, these existing launch sites are already heavily booked with other national space program payloads, and many of the rockets launching from these launch sites, apart from maybe, say, the Long March 5B, don't have the necessary payload capacity. And finally, challenge number four is, can China build so many satellites? Let's look at a map. Over the past five-ish years, China has built quite a few so-called satellite super factories. The Chinese Academy of Space Technology has built one in Tianjin, Kasich has one in Wuhan, Galaxy Space is wrapping one up in Nantong City, Genesat and China Microsat both have a factory in Shanghai, G-Space has one in Taizhou, and CGSTL seems to be interested in building Comsats in their facilities in Changchun. Now, let's imagine that all of this satellite manufacturing capacity is directed towards Chinese mega constellations. Once again, this is enough for 2025 and 2027 targets, but not for 2030. And especially if you take into account that all these estimates I've discussed up to now are for one mega constellation, which is Qianfan, but remember that there's a second mega constellation called Xinguang, which doubles the requirements in launch vehicle, launch site, and satellite manufacturing capacity. We don't know much today about the Xinguang constellation deployment timeline but they issued in the past filings to the International Telecommunication Union in 2020. And so based on ITU constellation obligations, we know that they will have to deploy 1300 satellites by 2029, 6500 by 2032, and the entire constellation by 2034. So what's my take on all this? I feel like based on these publicly known plans, 
Satellite manufacturing seems to be the weak link here. The existing and planned factories just don't seem to have the production capacity. And this is something that China will have to significantly upgrade by building new lines of production. On the launch side, again, it's going to be very challenging if both Chinese mega constellations are to be deployed with the current timelines, but not impossible as long as commercial companies build up their launch sites in time, that the commercial launch site in Hainan perhaps gets expanded, and that the development of commercial Falcon 9 class rockets does not get delayed. Now, that's a lot of ifs there, and we've seen recently that two hasty developments can lead to accidents. But hey, we've also seen China recently pull off some pretty challenging stuff in their space program. So you know, time will tell. But what do you think about Chinese mega constellations? Do you think that China will manage to follow its deployment schedule? Or perhaps do you think that these constellations will get delayed or perhaps that they should be merged? Let me know in the comments section below. As always, I want to say a special thank you to my patrons on Patreon.com and YouTube memberships. Thank you for helping me make this channel something more sustainable. And of course, if you're interested in family history, don't forget to check out my heritage with this QR code. Again, they have a fantastic product. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.